<clears throat> My name is Jamie Banks. I am assistant professor over in the Communication Studies Department. Um, broadly, my work has to do with interactive media and identity, but my specific kind of main line of research is how we connect with our avatars and sort of what that means for how we experience gameplay content. Uh, I think I was going to say something else here, but I don't. I'm well in this entry. <laughs> How's that? So I'm going to start out actually talking a little bit about how I got into this in the first place as maybe a way to frame my general approach. <clears throat> Uh, and most of my work is in World of Warcraft, so a lot of my examples come from that. Uh, but Dr. Bowman and I have uh, kind of replicated these studies across a number of different platforms and games and genres, and they still hold up, so it's all applicable across the board. But um, when I was first starting grad school, I was pretty sure I wanted to study social media and identity. And my advisor, she got a big government grant to look at communication and behavior in online games, and she said, you should come work with us, but you have to start playing World of Warcraft first. And I said no for a long time. And then finally I learned what their project was and how cool it was. And I was like, all right, I'll start playing World of Warcraft. And this was my first character that I leveled to any particular extent. And so I think this was around level 65. And if you've played WoW, you know that hunters have combat pets. And I was never, you know, it was just another tool, another kind of extension of my avatar until one day I was in Orgrimmar, the main city for the Horde. And I saw someone with this bear. And I was like, that's a cool ass bear. I need to have that bear. And so I went, and it's a rare bear. And uh, I, I camped out for two weeks waiting for this thing to spawn. And the first time, I accidentally killed it. And so I was a little upset about that. <laughs> Luckily, a few days later, it spawned again. And um, I was able to tame it. And my heart was beating really fast. And I, I play on a PvP server. So I got myself out of dodge and found a safe spot in the snow. It's very serene mountains and stuff, and I summoned it for the first time, and I just kind of got to know it a little bit. I was like, it's so beautiful, and it was like pulse, light pulsing out from the center of it, and all of a sudden I realized, I'm, I'm, am I crying? Am I crying? What's, what is even going on here? And so that was kind of the beginning of my journey for, into questioning this idea of the player avatar relationship. Why do we even connect to it in different ways? I'm like, it's a collection of pixels on a screen. Why am I like emotionally invested in this moment here? So to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, <clears throat> we generally understand avatars to be these graphic representations of users and games. And often they're humanoid in some fashion, not always, of course. And we understand them to be um, carriers of a player's agency and identity into a game environment. You guys will probably call them characters or player characters. From a game studies perspective, we often differentiate between characters as uh, you know, uh, avatars like Link or Mario that the game assigns to you, and avatars being those that you can customize and build yourself. Again, what we're seeing is these patterns hold up across um, both of these. I'm going to kind of use them interchangeably as we go forward here. So um, the reason why it's even important to think about this at all is related to this idea that effectively we do experience gameplay content like this, right? We see it, we absorb it, we might engage the challenge system, things like this. Um, but when we put an avatar in the game, it, sh it might shift things just a little bit. We will still experience that gameplay content, but the avatar, in a sense, also sits between us and the, and the content. So we experience the avatar. We experience the content in relation to the avatar because the avatar is that thing that allows us to actually change stuff in the game world, right? But what we're going to focus on today is this. And the idea is that if we can understand the connection between the player and the avatar, that we can understand a little bit better what this whole system looks like and how that might affect gameplay. So when we think about non-interactive media, right, we are all familiar with um, hating on Joffrey in Game of Thrones. We love to hate him and yell at him. We like to watch horror movies sometimes. And we don't go in there! We understand these to be parasocial relationships. They're not fully social because they're one way. And effectively, those relationships exist in our brains, and that's about it, right? But with video games, uh, and I'll tell you that kind of a little more traditionally, this is still the approach to studying video game characters. Um, we think of it in terms of identification. We think, think of it in terms of parasociality. But I don't agree with that. I actually think that because of the ways that avatars act back on us, they give us feedback in lots of different ways. We can consider that to actually potentially be a fully social relationship. 
if we look at the definition of a relationship. This is kind of the theory-based definition from like 1978 Bone, kind of the, the traditional one. A valence connection between two people where each party influences the other. Well, we've got this influence down, right? If I tell my World of Warcraft character to do something, it will either give me some sort of feedback that says, yes, I've done it. Maybe it's a sparkly associated with casting a spell. Or maybe it's saying, I don't have enough mana, right? It gives us those cues back. It acts back on us. We act on it, it acts on us. A valence connection, that just means one person has to think it's somehow good or bad or has value in some particular way. Our only challenge here in this definition is that people part. Let's get rid of that people part and think of them as agents, right? Agency we understand as um, the, a mattering, a type of mattering, an ability to make an impact on something. Well, kind of through that influence, it, it, it works that way by definition. So I started to explore the, um, the nature of the player avatar relationship from this perspective, kind of saying, yeah, it can be parasocial, but can it actually be fully social? So without going into too many of the details about the, the research uh, part of it, we have been looking at this phenomenon, me for five years, roughly. Um, Nick actually has been doing it for a few years longer than that. We've done a lot of this work separately and together. Um, I think together now we have done about seven studies, crossing about 2,000 gamers, and uh, as I mentioned, all sorts of different um, platforms and games and narrative themes and things like this. Uh, surveys, experiments, direct observations, uh, interviews, uh, analyzing things like screenshots. So we're coming at it from a lot of different perspectives and we're pretty, pretty confident in this particular model we're gonna show you. This is Mount Mirban, by the way. He's kind of our lab mascot uh, in case, I think you've got on your mm -hmm. t-shirt today. He's kind of awesome. So this is the general pattern. And again, I'm not gonna go into too many of the details because I wanna give you the overall picture here. We found four major types, and this came out of some exploratory interviews and we've been building on this and trying to validate it. <clears throat> avatar as object, avatar as me, avatar as symbiote, and avatar as other. We're gonna unpack these a little bit. But the punchline here is that as you go further to the right, they actually do act more like human-human social relationships. So not everybody has these relationships, but there is definitely the potential. And in fact, most of the people that we, that we find sit on this side of it, it's either just a tool or it's somehow an extension of myself. And may, anywhere between, in a given sample, um, 10 to 20% fall somewhere in one of these categories. Which is kind of interesting because in game studies, everybody kind of geeks out about this idea, you know, we take the narrative very seriously and it's super meaningful. And it definitely is meaningful to these people but the vast majority of people don't identify with their character, or they see it more as um, the, the avatar is me is kind of like how you might like your favorite t-shirt, like it's part of me. Naturally, I like wear it every day. Um, these guys is more like their favorite golf club. It's something that I use, but it's not necessarily a part of me. So let's kind of dig into each one of these real quick. I'm gonna offer just kind of a quote from some of the interviews that exemplify what this sounds like from these players' own mouths. And then I have a little bit of a screenshot that, that some research participants have given me that I think kind of helps flesh out the picture. So first we have Avatar's object. And remember that's on this end. And it's totally non-social, it doesn't even look parasocial. It's basically, uh, this type of relationship is a tool relationship. It's a game piece, it's something I use to play the game. So a lot of, you know, synth, and people chose um, pseudonyms here, so that are, sometimes they sound a little funny. But this guy was basically saying, you know, I use it to play the game, and you could change it to any other format, and it wouldn't matter, because I don't, I don't even pay attention to it as a thing. It's just the device that I use to play the game. Um, I think he, w this, this was somebody else, but fell into that same category. He was old school rating molten core. And you can barely even see this character in the middle of the screen because he's paying attention to all of the mechanics of the game. So these, um, these players tend to have like low emotional investment in the character, sometimes very high emotional investment in the game, but low emotional investment in the character. And they tend to be very, um, very achievement oriented. They're the completionists. They, want, they're, they often are PvP players or hardcore raiders. Um, jumping up to the next one, Avatar is me. Again, object was the most, is the most prevalent in both samples. Second highest is gonna be the avatar as me. So the idea here is that these are, these are really people who are, see their character as Chris says here, an extension of my arm into the world. It is, I, it allows me to do what I want. It is me in that environment. 
these tend to be highly social players. They want to go in and play with their friends. They're also very ritualistic players. So it's kind of like uh, I come home from work and I sit down with a beer at my computer and I just do that every day. So they're, they're, they want to, this kind of makes sense when you think about when you go and hang out with your friends, you don't want to hang out with your friends as, um, I don't know, Snarfy the Gnome. You want to hang out with your friends as you in some sense, right? So they'll, these are the players that will often um, go in and use Skype, for example, to play games and hang out on event channel even without being in the game. So this was Cleve. And Cleve was one of my favorite participants because he was trying so faithfully to reproduce himself in his avatar. Uh, he was a student of like natural science. He was like, I can't remember his exact job, but it, it involved like tagging wildlife and bugs and documenting things out in the wilderness. He lived in a cabin out in the woods. And it was a terrible inter interview actually because he was on a satellite. <laughs> it was really bad. So um, he is, in his everyday life, he enjoys hunting. He has this close relationship with all of these animals that live around his cabin. Um, he considers himself to be kind of a mountain man, and he has a beard. So there's, I mean, down to some very, like, discreet details, this is a hunter. He has a beard. He's short and stocky. Um, one of the particular animals he was in charge of studying and documenting was a northern solid owl. And so his hunter pet, as we talked about before, was always an owl. So you can see how they're trying to make these faithful extensions of themselves into the game. And then these are kind of my favorites, the Avatar symbiote. They're totally weird. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a person that was an alcoholic, Kane. And he used avatars to help solve problems, kind of work through identity issues. And that is characteristics of these symbiotes. Uh, when you have this kind of relationship with a character, you're kind of flipping back and forth. It kind of is me, but it's kind of not me. And often what they will do is they will create their ideal selves in their avatars and then practice being that in the world. And as soon as they get comfortable with it, they will start to bring those pieces into their everyday lives. So you can see it's kind of fluid. It's a little back and forth. And almost sometimes it almost, it kind of looks like codependence. Like we exist, we can't exist apart from each other because we're so wrapped up in each other. It's kind of fascinating. So Cain, uh, with his, uh, if you're familiar with Blood Elf lore, they're addicted to magic. And so as he was working through uh, his alcoholism recovery, he was drawing on Blood Elf lore to sort of work through what this meant. Because in the same way that in the lore, Blood Elves kind of, as their racial differentiator, magic is both their, their burden and their boon. It's the thing that makes them incredibly powerful, but also is their weakness. And he saw alcohol in that same way and sort of found a little bit of, of personal therapy in actually playing his avatar through these stories. Um, the other thing about the symbiotes is they often tend to have some sort of malady, some sort of thing that's negatively affecting their life. Uh, this, this woman, she had severe social anxiety. So she knew herself, who she was, but she couldn't get it out. And so she saw her avatar as the person she actually wanted to be in her everyday life, but actually couldn't be. And so she was one of those who, would, who very purposely would practice certain strategies for talking to people. She said, six months ago, I couldn't have had this interview with you. She said, I, can't talk, I, can't, I cannot even get on the phone and talk to my, students, te my, my kid's teacher. She said, this is the thing that allows me to try to do this. And then finally, we have Avatar is Other. And these are the people who engage their avatar as a completely distinct and autonomous social agent. These are the ones that look most like human-human relationships. And they're equally fascinating. So um, they are people who are really driven to play by immersion and escapism. They protect the game world as a real world and as separate from their everyday life. So in this instance, um, Heiko, he had a, his avatar's name was Lav, and you'll see him in a second. There's a, a famous torture quest in Northrend in the northernmost island uh, of the kind of the WoW universe. And he said, I cannot do it with this avatar. My avatar would not do this. He said, I, as a gamer, I totally wanted to do that and continue with the quest chain. I said, but this avatar, he would never do that. So I would make him do it. He saw his character as having its own moral governing system. And he, as a player, was basically in service to this, this entity, this social agent, and would not sort of violate that relationship. 
So a couple years ago, uh, with the Cataclysm expansion in World of Warcraft, for example, um, and this is this is Lab, his uh, his character. Um, as you may know, basically Azeroth, the world of Warcraft, got ripped apart by a nasty dragon. And uh, this is a, uh, a starting zone, uh, little like outpost, and it was just a bunch of traders. But it was a really important place for a lot of horde players because when you're low level. Back in the vanilla days, when you had to grind your way up, they spent a lot of time here. After the interview, he was so affected by this because he had never seen it, and so we went and kind of went through that together. He sent me this picture. He was so upset over this, but it was also that he felt like his avatar was really upset with this. He didn't just say, I'm, I'm upset, because that's easy enough to say. He sent me a picture of his avatar crying. And that kind of goes back into this whole idea that his avatar would even be upset in the first place because it has its own thoughts, its own feelings, its own emotions. So I'll save a little bit of the details here, um, but there is an indication that some stuff happens where you can actually change, your relationship might change. And this is really important for how you might consider how certain game design aspects come into play when it, when it comes to sort of shaping the player character relationship for whatever goals you might have for a particular game. Basic idea is when you wrap a story around it, it becomes more social. Think about if you took a chess piece. We never think, it's just a little chess piece, right? But if you draw some eyes on it, like Nick likes to draw eyes on things, um, and maybe you gave it a name, and maybe you gave it a reason for going to the other side of the board. Well, that all of a sudden becomes a little bit more interesting, and it starts to act in kind of human-like ways, maybe, in your brain, right? So while role players tend to be more on this end, it's not only role players. But they do tend to be on that end because they have these very complex stories wrapped around their characters. Um, the other, <clears throat> excuse me, the other main thing is this other direction. And that is the more challenging the game or more intense the gameplay, the more it becomes like work, the more you're likely to have a less social relationship with your character. And this kind of plays into what you're gonna hear Dr. Bowman talk a little bit about in, in, uh, in his talk. And that has to do with, it's kind of hard to pay attention to both the challenge and the narrative at the same time. They're almost in conflict with each other. And I'll, we have basically been spending the last couple of years trying to tease apart what makes this up, what makes you fall along this continuum of sociality. <clears throat> these are the four areas we've come up with. I'm gonna talk about, kind of going back to the idea of challenge. That matches up a lot with this sense of control. If you feel like you have a lot of control over your avatar, you're going to be down on this end because you're dealing with controlling a character in relation to that challenge, right? But if you're going toward that other end, you are dealing with emotional investment. How much do I care about it? What would I do if I lost it? Is it special to me, right? Um, anthropomorphic autonomy. <clears throat> this is kind of our phrasing for the fact that I think it is kind of like a human, and I think it exists on its own in a human-like fashion. That is having its own thoughts, its own feelings, its own life, right? Suspension of disbelief is the other one that kind of drives you down. This goes along with that narrative angle, right? If I am willing to engage the avatar as real and its world as real, then I'm more likely to see it as a social agent. In part, these things kind of play together, but in part, I mean, I have to, I have to be willing to see it as something social in order for it to be experienced as social. So let's think just for a few minutes about how this might play out in different game designs. <clears throat> and I'm picking real quick just a couple of uh, serious game genres. Serious games, of course, being those that are designed for something other than fun, right? Um, if you'll notice a lot of children's games, children's <coughs> educational games, they don't really have avatars at per se. They don't have whole bodies. Why do you think that might be? We don't want the character to learn. We want the kid to learn. Right? So they're almost forcing people into a me orientation by not giving them a body and by almost putting them into this first person perspective, right? So that's why we do, this kind of functions, this hand functions as an avatar, but I mean, that's easy because a lot of these are on like iPads, right? Okay, so wherever I touch, that's where this hand moves. Okay, that, that lines up, right? That's almost like a naturally mapped type avatar. Um, then we go to like Darfur is dying. We have a hypothesis here that we are actually working with some game designers to build an experimental game to test this. Uh, Darfur is I, when you go into the game, it right off the bat says you are a villager. It has you choose from two, a male or female adult or a male or female child. This is the male child. 
and uh, you know, right off the bat it says, you are in the situation, you, you, you. So what they're trying to do in this design is kind of still force that me perspective, but there are some problems with how they do this, right? Um, you are controlling this thing, which for many Americans, which was kind of the main target, that doesn't look like me at all. And they're sort of trying to use language as a way to force you into that me perspective. Um, we may have a temporary sense of identification through the control of a character while we're playing the game. But think about what happens when you leave the game. The whole purpose of social change games is to get you to adopt some sort of an idea and then to take it outside and to continue to engage that idea and maybe even act on that idea, right? Um, for this game, it was basically like recognizing the plight of Darfurians and effectively the, the fact that you can't win this game is analogous to the fact that they just kind of can't get out of their bad situation. Right? Um, but when we leave the game, if this is too disparate from my own held identity as a middle class educated white girl, how, how am I supposed to actually take that and retain that sense of identification that came through this control? It, we actually believe that if you were to frame this in terms of um, not you are the villager, but your job is to help the villager, a helper role is something we can more easily take out and keep with us after we leave the game. So um, the, the game that we're, we're working to, uh, to, we're collaborating on developing is related to empathy and aggression. We have a little monster who gets bullied in school. And in one version of the game, you are the monster. In another version of the game, your job is to help the monster get through his, his rough day at school. And we think actually that, that that helper role will engage greater, will build greater empathy, especially when we give him a task after the game. So that's kind of the, the process that we're working on to sort of tease apart how are these different framings actually impacting you know, the gameplay experience and how it might affect you afterwards. So um, I'm not going to go through these, but these are some of the associations that these dimensions of the, the player avatar relation as we've teased them apart, um, what they can predict. The one I kind of want to focus on is this meaningfulness, and that ties directly back to that Darfur is dying example. We do find that the more you sort of move toward this social end of the spectrum, the more you engage the narrative. Um, it goes back to suspension of disbelief. You have to wrap a narrative around it to see it as human at all, right? So if you create a situation where, uh, where the character is another, that may mean that they'll be more engaged in the story of the game, right? So in terms of other ways that this might be useful to you as you start building your games, um, just think about the purpose of the game, like what's your goal for the player experience, and which one of these main categories of relationships might best serve that goal? Do you want them to just see their character, if there's a character at all, as a tool, Right? Or do you want it to see as an extension of themselves so they feel like they're doing something? Or do you want it to be a little bit more fluid so they can do some problem solving or maybe look at alternate ways of being in the world and in the game environment? Or do you want them to see it as an other, as a partner that they can have some sort of more social relationship with? The other thing is if you look at these four factors in terms of how we study in, um, like communication and media, these are social factors, these are human factors, and these are media factors, or technical factors of the game, right? So how, do, how does the game design as a structure and as a logic, how does that play with some of these more human-like bits? Because when it comes down to it, the player avatar relationship as we've unpacked it is two parts social, two parts technical. That's kind of neat, right? And then, Going back to that very first image that I showed you where we experience both the game content and the content through the avatar, think not only about how the player might be connecting with the avatar, but also how that avatar connects with the environment. If, we're if it's a mediator, right? How does that connect with the environment, maybe the task, maybe the story? How are all these pieces fitting together? And how might that mediation through the avatar actually impact how they are experiencing the game as well? And I was four minutes early. Can I answer any questions for you guys? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Banks.